we ask these questions, we figure out what happened in, in, with the client in their past to kind of prevent that from happening again and also to improve their current situation. So even if a client's in a situation where they're making money, they're profitable, they have positive cash flow, they're able to save, we, we, could, take, we could take that and then try to figure out a way to improve it, to make it better. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hi, and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. My name's Rick Nusky. Tell you what, I am the luckiest man today because I'm on the line with Sari Ibrahim. How are you, Sari? Hey, Rick, thanks for having me on. I'm good. Absolutely, my pleasure to have you here. It's gonna be a wonderful conversation, Sari. We're gonna be talking about uh, your bank on yourself concept. We're gonna be talking about a lot of the foundational stuff that goes behind this. I've seen a lot of your work uh, on your website, which is at uh, finassetprotection.com, um, but, Sari, before we do that, it's custom to um, step back a little bit from the business components and talk about you as an individual, a person away from the business, because after all, businesses are run by people, and I think it's good for context to uh, learn a little bit more about you. Things like uh, where you're located, and uh, do you have any hobbies or pastimes? Do you get into sports and that sort of thing? Would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself with the show? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, in the States. Uh, I was born and raised here, lived here my whole life. Uh, currently, my wife and I would live in the city, uh, on the north side of Chicago, if you know where the Cub Stadium is, that's, mm -hmm. where, that's where we're at. <laughs> and uh, I've been, um, I graduated about five years ago with my master's degree in business, and I kind of was, was hooked on business. I've always been interested in business, um, and not only just from like the, the financial part of, of making money, but more so, you know, in theory of yeah. how it works and marketing, accounting, finance, all those subjects kind of really got my attention. Um, so I kind of grew up, you know, my, my parents are entrepreneurs and, and I grew up in a, in, in a household where, you know, being an entrepreneur is, was, was important and almost like a, a, not a requirement, but that was something I always saw myself doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I got my, that's, that's one of the reasons why I went to grad school. And, and while I was in grad school, I also had some sales jobs. I was working for Allstate Insurance in, in risk mitigation and sales and then kind of merged into different, I jumped around in different companies. I got into the healthcare world and I was in the Medicare field and I was working with companies like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Humana, Cigna. And I was working with a lot of retirees, people who were like uh, 64, 65 years old, merging onto their own Medicare plans, leaving their employer plans. Mm -hmm. And that was fun too. It was really rewarding. And it was, it was, it became like a passion of mine just to help people. And, and again, it wasn't necessarily about the money, um, but it also led me to become like a problem solver, like to think of, filling in the gaps for, for people. And, and if you were to ask me like, what's my definition of business? I would say that it's, it's just filling in the gaps for people and, and then being compensated to do so. Like you're, you're solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think once I, I figured that out, it led me to other niches and other markets, such as um, the this concept called the bank on yourself concept, also known as the infinite banking concept. And I talk a lot about this on other podcasts, especially like real estate investing podcasts and entrepreneurship or podcasts about entrepreneurship. I talk about this and it's a concept where you use life insurance, but mainly for the cash benefits, for the living benefits while you're alive, you get to use this policy um, to grow a safe, predictable wealth, regardless of market conditions. I don't know about, you know, different places in the world, but this is a concept used in, used in the U S and in Canada. Um, and it's pretty much the utilization of cash value, whole life insurance, mainly for the living benefits. So this is what I've been doing now. And then I founded the company Financial Asset Protection. And this is our primary niche, our primary focus now. And that's pretty much uh, where, where we're at today. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Sari, for, for sharing. If I can, we, we will we'll be swinging back to this conversation in some detail, but there are some foundational questions, but there's one about, um, you talked a little bit earlier about your family being entrepreneurs at heart, and you were always exposed around that. Um, did that have a positive impact on your mindset um, towards business in general, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um... I, I would always wonder why, you know, my, my dad would be able to kind of have his own schedule. And I thought that was the case for everyone, you know, and he explained to me it's because he had, he's, he's an entrepreneur, you know, yeah. he doesn't have a boss. And then, so I kind of grew up thinking like, you know, I, I, I didn't necessarily want to do what he does. He owned, you know, a dealership and a auto financing business. Um, I didn't, wasn't necessarily attracted to that, but I was attracted to being an entrepreneur and just having like 
uh, my own schedule, my own time and, and building something on, on my own, you know, yeah. uh, with, of course, with partners, with associates, with colleagues. But at the same time, it was about, uh, in my opinion, you know, uh, the, the structure that I had was eventually it would be something that I, that I had to do. And every time I, I worked, I, this is actually the, the third time I start this business because the first two times I failed. And that's that's part of being an entrepreneur, right? It's, it's failing and getting back up and failing. And that's my favorite part. You know, the, the failing part is my favorite part because the first time I failed, I thought I should never go back to entrepreneurship. <laughs> and, then I, and then I did it again. And then the third time, um, you know, this is now it's working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fantastic. I love to yeah. hear those stories though, sorry, because uh, the, the My Future Business audience is made up of startups, uh, existing small to medium sized business owners and, um, and authors. And they like to hear those stories because that brings the reality to uh, to what it means to actually be trying to make a difference in people's lives. So very important insights. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. Um, uh, in terms of the things I want to cover today, I'd like to go from the very foundation of um, financial literacy. In, in your line of work and the way that you work with your clients, I'd love to talk about some of the products that you, you help people with. But from a very basic level, is having an understanding of finance important as a starting point, do you think? I I mean, I, I'm not saying this because I'm in this field, but I think it's the most important. It's it's the top, you know, top three or four things that everybody in the world should understand. You know, everything revolves around money. Money is just a tool. It's just an object that we use to get around, but it's everywhere. And it's required, you know, in every currency, in every place in the world. Um, it's something that people need to understand, and not necessarily about having the, a lot of money, but understanding how money works. And it, and to and to your point, financial literacy. You know, that's very important. Um, and and this is something, unfortunately, I would have learned in school. And uh, we wish. should. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. It's not something that we, uh, you know, it's not a curriculum per se. It's sort of uh, an inadvertent conversation, isn't it, in our in our school systems? Yeah, exactly. Instead of, you know, I'm a fan of history and art and all those different subjects, but instead of, you know, prioritizing those subjects that we're never going to probably end up using, we should at a very young age have, you know, here's, you know, economics, here's finance, here's the stock market, you know, at a very, very basic level. So it doesn't have to be too intricate, but this is how money works. This is how, you know, there's businesses, small businesses, medium businesses, there's bank accounts, you know, there's interest that you can earn on that money. So just like basic things that I think students should 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 learn at a very young age. And I think that'll impact the economy too if if more, if more younger people un, had more financial literacy. Yes, thank you. I, I sit here and I think to myself, um, I, just before the call, you and I just touched on how you were going and how things were in your local area. And um, there's lots going on in the world right now. And um, you, there's a pretty big statement that you make on the bank on yourself um, um, concept is that you can grow safe and predictable wealth regardless of market conditions. And when I read market conditions, it got me to thinking, well, what's happening geopolitically, what's happening politically locally, and what's happening in terms of health globally? Is it still possible given all of the challenges that we're facing nowadays? It's, it's still possible to have the safe and predictable wealth, the growth with, uh, with everything that's going on now in the world. And, and pr primarily it's because of the way um, the, the policies we use, the way they're structured. And, and I'll kind of, if you don't mind, I'll kind of take a dive. In, yeah, in, absolutely. In, what it is exactly. So, um, so I, I came across this came across this book called The Bank on Yourself Revolution by Pamela Yellen. And the book pretty much talks about this concept, the bank on yourself concept and growing safe, predictable wealth. And pretty much it is uh, using whole life insurance, mainly for the, the living benefits. So for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, whole life insurance has two functions or two parts to it. It has the life insurance part, and mm -hmm. then it has cash value, like a savings account within the policy that you could use. And that cash that you have in the policy grows every year because it gets dividends from the from the insurance company it's a part of. Yeah. Uh, and they, and then so it's growing every year and you always have access to this money. Now insurance companies are regulated differently than, you know, financial institutions and banks. They can't invest in speculative investments, they can't invest in the stock market. They can only invest in the bond market. About 60 to 80% of their portfolio is made up in, in the bond market. And then 20 to 40% is made up in private loans. So in, in other words, insurance companies have, have proven track records of safe returns for over 160 years. And especially the companies we work with, they've been around for over 160 years. And they've been paying dividends every year, even during the Great Depression, even during the 2008 market crash mm -hmm. in the United States, and even through right now with the uncertainties of the pandemic and, and the elections too of, of what's going on. 
uh, in the United States, um, they are still paying out dividends um, regardless of those conditions. And, and it's because they're not invested where everyone else is invested. They're not. So when, when the stock market goes up and down, it, that doesn't reflect the, the performance of insurance companies. And that's how and why we, we help clients grow these funds safely and predictably. Right. Um, it, this is this is something that actually large corporations and banks use their back their backbones their their safety nets are whole life insurance and they fund these policies and they always have liquidity to so they can reach into grab that money if they need to and it grows so when the stock market crashes and a lot of people lose money mm-hmm. they don't lose money they yeah. have it in whole life insurance so that's kind of a go oh I know I, I know I was talking forever no 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 <laughs> no I think it's absolutely important to give some context uh, sorry so thank you very much um, in terms of the products that you're offering. When you, when you meet somebody and they're a high net worth individual, does that impact the way that uh, you configure a product for them? Yeah, awesome question. So what we, we always do is when we, with, when we meet with clients, we do a financial analysis call. That's, that's a call pretty much where we take a dive into their assets, into where they're currently going, their needs, wants. And then we, we kind of get a good idea, a good picture of, of where they want to go. And then from that information that we collect in the financial analysis call, we build out the, the, the actual end result product. Mm. And, and it is the, you know, the infinite banking product or the bank on yourself product specifically designed for that individual and, that, and, the, and at that time as well. And also it could be for the company. So we have some clients where the, the company is the owner and then that reflects the, the minds and, and the needs and wants of the executives or the owners of the company. So people who are in charge of the company and we kind of, we figured this out during the analysis call, but of course, you know, uh, no two clients are the same. You know, um, we have, we primarily work with three main insurance companies. We're like brokers to those insurance companies and each insurance company that we work with has like 10 different products. So it's really hard for us to guess which product and which company and which amounts to fund it would be best for the client, which is why we do that full thorough 90 minute, 60 to 90 minute analysis to kind of figure out exactly like how will this improve them? And it's not necessarily about just, you know, simply buying insurance, but rest of, but how to take them where they're at right now and where they want to go and use it as a tool to, to bridge them to, to that need or that want or that goal. Yeah, that's fantastic. This knowledge um, is very important for where, for when people want to make decisions. And I think you would rely heavily on, I guess, customizing products for your clients, but also um, data analysis. How important is that that data analysis initially? And how do you do that? Yeah, it's it's the most important piece. It's about it's 70 percent. They're talking at the mm-hmm. time. Most of the time, the client's talking because we're asking thorough questions. We're asking questions like, uh, have they had any uh, fluctuate, fluctuations in the income they, they earned in the last three to five years? Um, how, how many current sources of income do they have? How much do they have in assets? Where is it? Is it in high risk, medium risk? Um, what, what type of financial vehicles do they use? Um, do they have any real estate investment properties? Are they any income producing properties? So we kind of dig, we figure out with the current cash flow, we figure out current assets, um, where which asset class they're at. And then from there, we kind of identify some problems, you know, if like, for example, if somebody has a lot of money in the stock market and over the last 10 years, they've seen twists and turns and they don't want to see those that happen for the next 10 years. They're kind of tired of that, those twists and turns of the stock market. We'll, we'll, we'll base a policy based on that. And then we'll say, Mr. Klein, you mentioned that you were, you wanted, you didn't want the volatility of the stock market anymore. This policy will not have any volatility regardless of what happens, you know, where, or it might be some situation where somebody um, went through, somebody's a real estate investor, for example, and they were funding properties and with all their liquidity, all their cash, they were putting it back into properties, but then they reached a situation where they couldn't borrow anymore from banks uh, because they had some issue in their credit or some issue with their cash flow. And then even though they had the, the properties paid up in cash, they couldn't refinance them to take money out. And then with whole life insurance, that won't happen. Once you fund it, you always have guaranteed liquidity. You never have to qualify for the loan so that we can tie that in. So we, we ask these questions, we figure out stories, what happened in, in, with the client in their past to kind of prevent that from happening again and also to improve their current situation. So even if a client's in a situation where they're making money, they're profitable, they have positive cash flow, they're able to save, we, we, could, take, we could take that and then try to figure out a way to improve it, to make it better. Um, what about the physical condition of an applicant? Does that have a bearing on this process? Yeah. So with every every product that we 
we uh, execute on. There is um, a medical underwriting part to it, mm -hmm. a part where we, we submit it to the insurance company and it takes about four to six weeks of medical underwriting. And they go through like their medical history, prescription drugs are taken, if any, uh, and things like that. And, and you do have to qualify for the policy. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that we've seen that as a problem sometimes where some people, you know, financially they're, they're there, but medically or uh, physically they're not yeah. um, there are some solutions to it we could do other types of products like for example annuities annuities don't require medical underwriting we could do that we could also have it like for example if it's two spouses where we where the other spouse is the insured but the other one is is the owner of the policy um, so there's a lot of ways to kind of you know get around it um, we just it and figure exactly and this is part also of the financial analysis call we, we ask these questions too during the call um, to see if we can find other insurable interests just in case we do hit that obstacle with with medical underwriting. Now, one of the things that I always think about is that uh, in this line of work, you must build relationships. It's not transactional. Do you have long-term relationships with the people that you work with? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned yeah, it's not transactional at all. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's almost like the equivalent of, of asking somebody to, to marry you, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you, it's not something you can just do on, on the first date, you know, it takes a, a relationship. Uh, and that's exactly what we do. You know, I, the average time it takes me from the time I talk to somebody on, on the phone, when most of my clients are over the phone, um, from the time I talk to them on the phone to the time I close them and, and actually, uh, they submit payment towards a policy. It's about six months. So yeah. it takes time and we're going back and forth and they want to review, you know, a little bit more content. They want to review, they want to talk a couple more times and that's fine. We have all the time necessary for that. I'm, I'm never in a rush to, you know, to close a deal. Um, and we provide, we provide all our clients with, you know, podcasts, YouTube videos. We send them free books um, until they're ready, until they, they can actually understand this concept completely. And, and also be comfortable with us and us working with them because we're not just there to close a deal and then never see them again. We do six month reviews with them. We talk to their friends, families. We're always there. It's kind of, it's a recurring process and it's, it's almost like it keeps going, you know? Earlier you talked about uh, how you were speaking with clients and they, they had different physical asset classes such as homes and, and the likes. Um, although this might be left of field to the direct um, product and advice you provide, which is not part of this call. This is not about advice. This is just about, I guess, tapping into your thought process. Is it, do you think it's, um, you know, an, an option for people to be buying homes either to live in uh, or to rent in this regard? Would that help in this, in this respect with your products? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so pretty much, um, and, and I mentioned this too on, uh, with, with clients, you know, it's not an either or concept. It's not either, you know, you're putting money into whole life insurance or you're putting into real estate or you're putting it in other places. Yep. It's a matter of integration. So you're able to integrate it with other areas. So you can fund this policy that we talk about, the, the whole life policy, and then you could borrow from it and then use that to invest in real estate or even use to pay down your own mortgage that you have. A lot of different things we could do and, and, and kind of maneuver, but it, it's all about, you know, the, understanding the integration. It's not either or. Um, and, and pretty much, and again, it comes down to the analysis. I keep saying the analysis call. It comes down to that for us to kind of figure out what the client is thinking, you know. And, and I think, too, for the audience and other entrepreneurs, you know, this is an important lesson, too. Um, you actually, you, you do better in sales when you, um, and, and you sell more when you understand the client's mind. This is something that took me a while to figure out, but once I figured it out, it kind of, like, unlocked a lot more things when you can kind of really uh, understand what the client means as well, you know. So these are just some, some tips to share. Yeah, thank you. That's very important. It's very relevant to um, today's call. Again, thank you for sharing. Now, uh, in terms of, I guess, uh, the way that we manage money nowadays, we're seeing a move away from uh, physical cash for, for the most part to a cashless society. Are you seeing that? And does that have uh, an impact on the numbers on, uh, you know, on paper for you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, what impact that I see this on is or, or see this with is that when we go from, you know, physical cash to more digital, digital cash, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's convenient in a lot of situations. However, it's problematic in the sense of savings. So it's much harder. And in my opinion, I think this it's much harder to save when your money is easy, easy, uh, is, is very easy to access. I think it's very hard to save. And, and we see this a lot, you know, in the States, you know, like 60%, they did a study, 60% of people in the States don't even have, in the United States don't even have $1,000 in a bank account. 
and it's not an income problem. It's a, it's a savings problem. It's because people spend too much money. Think about it. You have your debit card or your credit card or some sort of bank app that you could transfer money. You could pay all your bills electronically. It's very easy to spend a lot of money, essentially. Uh, and I think that this, the, the concept that we use can kind of have uh, a, a solution to that. It could be a solution to that problem because when you are funding this policy, a, a portion of every dollar you put into it is going towards this cash value account, this cash value part of the policy. Mm -hmm. And then you can borrow from that. But every time you want to borrow from that policy or from that account, you have to uh, fill out a form to the insurance company and then send it to them via mail, e I'm sorry, via email or fax. Yep. And then it takes about five to seven business days for the funds to actually get into your account. And then you could use those funds. Now, doing that, just adding that extra a couple of, of steps between you and your money actually increases the likelihood that you're going to save more money. And because your money is sitting somewhere that earns compound interest, the longer that you can have it sit there, the more money you can make on that money. So it's, it's a way to kind of really, it's like a mindset hack. You know, it's almost like a financial hack. Oh, yeah. You figure out a way to keep more of your money because it's sitting somewhere that's earning you more money. Because I'm thinking, I'm hearing this, um, sorry, and I think to myself, this is about behavior. Not only, you know, it's part of financial literacy is to have a, a certain behavior and put certain locks and keys and I guess barriers in front of you to do exactly what you've just said. But it's also would be an element of coaching for the people you work with. Would that be fair? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it takes it takes discipline to do this. But the good thing about this is that it can create the discipline for you. You can use this as a way to practice savings, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, and we coach our clients through this. You know, we, we help them kind of get that that growth mindset, the mindset of, you know, thinking like a bank or thinking like a large corporation where you want to retain all your profits. You want to retain your money for as long as you possibly can and not like the mindset of a consumer where you're just spending and then once they understand that, then it's almost like the table turns, you know, the clients come, they say, all right, let's do this. Let's move money from here to this account. Let's do one for, you know, my son, let's do one for my daughter, let's do one for my, sp my spouse. Mm -hmm. And they take control because they understand it and they believe it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know that part of this is obviously um, about tax. A lot of people maybe incorrectly try to do their tax by themselves. Is it, do you think it's important for people to get a little bit wiser and, um, engage with a tax agent and build a relationship with them when it comes time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he says, always invest in, in professionals, always invest in people and lawyers, accountants, financial planners, you know, keep and then have a team, keep them on your side, have a team. Um, you know, one mistake, especially when you're an entrepreneur, a business owner, and you own different types of businesses and assets, you know, one mistake could mean a, a, a more taxes than you have to actually pay or more penalties. So yeah, having a tax professional, you know, in your team uh, is crucial, especially if you're, if you're a business owner, you know, uh, things are always changing. And I don't think that it's worth, you know, the fees, you know, a, um, a couple hundred dollars to save a couple hundred dollars on the professional where you're just doing it yourself, you know, that, you, you know, you might save you hundreds of thousands of dollars in the long run by hiring somebody who does it for a living. And it would keep you, keep you sane, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, <yep. laughs> Hey, um, um, which category do you fall into? Is it financial planning or advisory? Is it both or one or another or something else completely? Yeah, a good question. So it's kind of um, never really thought about it that way, but it's more of planning, you know, because yeah. um, when, I, when I think of financial advisor, I think of more like uh, like advising on stocks, bonds, mutual funds, more traditional financial fi fi financial advisory. But I'm more on the planning and almost in a sense, like financial coaching side, you know, where I I, I would I would never just you know pitch a product to every person. Instead, you know, listen to them and figure out you know how could this actually help them. So more on the planning and coaching side. Yeah, I, I know that you've talked about the assets and um, you know how we can make your money work for you. If you have some pretty serious assets, some large assets, um, physical assets, um, what are some of the mechanisms in place? Let's just walk through an example of how you would help your clients protect the assets that they have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So for example, one of my clients, uh, he's a real estate investor, and he sold one of his properties for uh, $400,000 in cash. And then he, he kind of he wanted to protect this money, uh, instead of just rolling it into another real estate property, he mm -hmm. wanted to put it somewhere that was liquid somewhere cash, like, like backed by a cash asset. And what he did was he, he thought of doing like a, a CD or, or a money market account that would earn him some interest, but because interest rates are low nowadays in those, within those accounts, he decided to do um, a single premium whole life policy. So a one-time 
payment towards a whole life policy. Mm -hmm. And when he did this, he had two instant benefits. He had a cash value available of $375,000. And then he had death benefit or life insurance amount of $580,000. And, and this is important because two things happen at this point. Um, he has cash value that grows every year, regardless of the market conditions. Mm -hmm. And then he has a second part, uh, the life insurance that keeps growing. And then no further contributions are required to, to keep building this policy up. And in the sense of asset protection or the way this connects to it is that in most, uh, in most states in the U in the U S um, the cash value of a whole life insurance policy is protected from creditors and, and people trying to sue you and, and bankruptcy and things like that. So this right now, and we're in the state of Illinois, and it is protected in the state of Illinois, but I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an attorney, so consult with your attorney before you go doing this. Um, he's able now to protect his cash, and he can still access it at the same time. So even if he is in a bad financial situation where nobody will loan him money, he can go to his whole life policy that he invested in and then use that to invest in more real estate. And now he essentially has his own mortgage company or his own lending company. He's, he's, he's insourced this, this position his finance position. So now instead of going to a bank, he can go to himself and then he can pay himself back with interest and the interest goes back to his account and it grows every year and it keeps compounding. And then when he passes away, he will leave that as a legacy for his family. So it's a way to kind of, you know, the, the ball keeps going and it, it really decreases your external ex exposures. It's like a risk mitigation strategy and not just from market risk, not just from the stock market, but from creditors, predators um, against the risk of you not being bankable anymore and being able to borrow, it, it, it hedges against our risk. So it's kind of like numerous, it has numerous fu functions and, and benefits. Yeah, it's excellent insight. Uh, insight. I, I, I think to myself, I see that people would come to you, they're in a situation where they have some pretty serious debt and they're looking for a way out. And this is a, uh, I guess, a financial vehicle to help them do that. Is there good debt and bad debt? Oh yeah, awesome, awesome question. Yeah, there definitely is good debt and, and bad debt. Uh, and one way to kind of differentiate the two, um, pretty much good debt could be like you, for example, borrowed to, to start a business or you, um, you borrowed to start a business and the terms of the loan are reasonable and you're gonna end up hopefully making more than mm -hmm. what you borrowed against. And you see this a lot in real estate investing where somebody will borrow you know, at, a, at a low interest rate and then be able to rent out the properties. And then by the time they pay off the mortgage every month, they have like a difference between how much they're spending on the mortgage and how much they're earning in cash flow. There's a, there's a positive difference between those. Yeah. And that would be an example of good debt because the, the debt and, and essentially is helping you achieve that financial goal. It's, it's a, you're using leverage. Yeah. Bad debt would be the opposite. Bad debt would be like, for example, having a credit card with like 16% interest on it. You're, you're at, at that point, if you max out that credit card, you'd probably never pay it off just paying the minimum payments. You'd end up paying a lot of interest to the lender um, and it wouldn't really be beneficial for you. There's, no, there's really no positive outcome on the other side of it. Um, it would be an obstacle. Dead you know, trap. then we could also, yeah, and then we, exactly a trap. And, and then we could also even say like, you know, student loans are arguable. You know, a lot of people, you know, in, in the United States, that's probably the, it's, it's rising. It's the, probably the highest debt. It's, we've reached over a trillion dollars in student debt. Wow. However, I still think that, yeah, I still think that it could be um, considered good debt because if you think about it, let's say somebody goes to a medical school or law school, you know, and they spend over you know, a quarter million on just on student loans or they, they, they rack up that much in student loans mm -hmm. and then they graduate and then, you know, they have to pay that back now. And usually it's at like three or 4% interest and they have to pay it back now. Uh, and they have usually their whole lives to pay it back. Um, but how much do you end up making usually as a, as a doctor or, you know, a lawyer or, prof or other professional or even entrepreneur, how much do you end up making as, as a result of your education? So I guess it's, it's, it's subjective, you, it's arguable, yeah. and, and it kind of depends on what you do with that debt. Yeah, so much to think about, isn't there? And it's, it's important for anybody who's on the show with us today, Sari, who is looking to make a start to, uh, I guess, as a young person trying to position themselves for the future, never is there a time than now to make that start. Um, but when people want to make that start, sorry, where are they going to go? And what is the process that you are going to take them through? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the first step is we, we have, you know, the introductory call, we, we, we get to know each other. And then from there we have that financial analysis call. 
and then we do the personalized solution call. And then from there, we, we execute, we, we, we figure out how to, to close it and how to, you know, get it to the insurance company and how to, to get them to their financial goals. That's excellent. So um, for everybody who's on the call today, um, if you want to start this process, visit finassetprotection.com. I will be making sure that the links back to uh, Sari's website and his wonderful team are available to you. No matter where you see this call, hear this call, you will find a link back to Sari. And Sari, I've just had such a wonderful time just cracking open the lid a little bit on this uh, this program, this product, Bank On Yourself. It's just been such a great call. Thank you very much for spending some time with me on the My Future Business Show today. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends, and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.